Hello, my name is Vangelis Bayortakis and I'm the designer of Freedom, an upcoming game by Phalanx. Freedom is a card-driven war game for two players set during the Greek War of Independence. It is about a siege that took place in 1825 in the city of Messalonghi. This is a fascinating time in history and it is in fact the most crucial siege that took place during that war. Its outcome affected the whole war and as a result the fate of all Europe. On one side we have the great Ottoman Empire. They want to crush the rebellion by all means and uh, they, want, they need to capture the city back. On the other side we have the insurgents, the Greek fighters within the city fighting for their freedom. This was a very very tense siege uh, with a lot of back and forth and you get to relieve it through this game. Let me show you how it plays. Here we have a game of freedom ready to start. On the lower part of the board you can see the city of Mesolonghi. We have the imperial troops represented by red cubes laid out in front of the wall ready to start the siege. Behind the wall we have the insurgent units represented by blue cubes ready to defend the city. The black cubes represent the cannons used by both sides. The white cubes represent the civilians within the city. We can also see the three islands that, played an important, that also played an important role during the siege. On the upper part of the board we see the surrounding area around Masologi. Actually this spot over here is the lower part of the board. You can see that these uh, places played an important role during the siege and uh, who controls them at the beginning of the siege is shown by the color of the tokens that we have laid on top of them. In the upper part we also have some tracks with important information. The, the blue is for the insurgents and the red is for the imperials. The main track on its side is called the morale track, where players track their side's morale. We also have a preparation track that is used for the player's actions and both sides also have a, a track for, uh, in which they show their plea for help from either the government or the high porter. The only difference is this track, which also is all only on the insurgent side, which is the food and population track. The player with the, uh, who plays the insurgents use it to track their population within the city and the amount of uh, supplies that they need to provide at the end of each round. Finally, there is also a track here on the top, which is used to track the current round. A game of freedom can last up to six rounds. The Imperials can win in one of three ways. The first one is if they manage to break through the wall and have Imperial troops in one of the four forts at the end of a round. The second way they can win is if they get to land Imperial troops in one of the southern parts of the city by moving them through the lagoon. The third way is if they get to lower the insurgents' morale to zero. The insurgents, on the other hand, can win in one of two ways. One, by managing to uh, defend the city by the end of the sixth round, or by lowering the imperial's morale to zero. Freedom is a card-driven war game. This means that all the player's actions are carried out through the use of cards. Every card depicts either an actual event that took place or a historical figure. Whenever a player plays a card, they can either apply its ability and play it for its event or use the action points listed on the top left corner. The color of the flag on the top left and on the matching title of the card indicates the side that benefits from the use of that card's event. A player may only play an, a card for each event if, the side, if it is on their side. For example, the insurgents may play this card for each event but may not play this one. Similarly, the imperials may play this card for the event but not this one. Both sides may play grey cards for their event and both sides may play any card for the action points listed on the top.
Let's have a look at what the players can do by spending their action points. We'll start with the Imperial player. The first thing that the Imperial player can do is move his troops. By spending one action point, they can move either one unit twice or they can use one action point to move two of their units by one space. An Imperial player can also move in the Lagoon, however this is considered to be a slow movement. In order for a player to move in the Lagoon, they spend one action point and move one unit one space. Another action that the Imperials can use is called the attack. In order for the Imperials to attack, they need to be in front of the wall. A unit can attack an insurgent unit on the wall by spending one action point. In that case, the player rolls two eight-sided dice. For the attack to succeed, they need to ha have a result of eight. So this attack would be successful while this attack would not. The, uh, the Imperial player can also spend money to uh, increase the odds of their attack. This is another action they can perform called reward attack. By spending one action point, all further attacks in the same turn have plus two bonus on their attack rolls, meaning that attacks of six, seven, rolls of six, seven, eight are also successful. One of the most important actions that the Imperial player can perform is called support. This allows them to add support tokens on the areas around Mesologi. When the Imperial player spends two action points, they add one support token in one of the areas under their control. If however they add support in an area they don't control, instead of putting one token, they remove one of their opponents. If more tokens are removed and only the tile remains, it is still under the insurgent control if the blue side is up. However, if the Imperial player spends one more support, the tile is turned the other way, indicating that now it is under Imperial control. Similar, similarly, if the insurgent player was to add support in an area, they would turn it back towards the blue side. Another action that the Imperial player can perform is called Plea for Funds from the High Porte. This effectively means that the player is asking from the Sultan for more money. When a player does that, they spend three action points and then they roll two six-sided dice. On a result of 1 to 11, the, their plea is successful and they get uh, the money that they requested. However, this track is moved forward by two spaces. On a future roll, the, the number on, uh, indicated by the track is going to be added to the roll, making it difficult to get uh, more money as time goes by. Finally, one of the very important actions that the uh, the Imperial player can take is to build cannon. Uh, the cannons are built here in the mainland area. In order to build one, it, first, it must first be in, in the camp, indicated by this area. The cost to build the cannon depends on uh, the distance from the wall. When a, a player wants to build a cannon on this row, it costs three action points. In order to build it on this row, it costs five, and in order to build it in front of the wall, it costs 7 action points. If a player wants to spend a lot of action points, they are not able to do it in a single round because the action points on the cards go up to 4. So, in order to build those cannons, the player will have to use the preparation track. And this is the last action that the Imperial player can perform. It's called preparation. And by spending one action point, they store it for future use. The insurgent player has a different set of actions. The first thing they can do is called regroup. This allows them to spend one action point and move one of their units anywhere they want within the city. The ad another action they can do is attack. This allows an insurgent unit to attack an imperial unit in front of the wall. For the player to do so, they spend one action point and they roll a single eight-sided die. Any result of six, seven or eight is considered a success. 
since in this case they are on top of the wall and it is easier for them to attack their opponent. The insurgent player can also perform raids which allows them to attack imperial units that are not in front of the wall. For a unit to perform a raid they spend action points equal to the distance between the wall and the imperial unit. In this case for example if this unit was to perform a raid here the insurgent player would need to spend three action points since the distance is one two three. In that case any result of five or higher is considered to be a success. In this case it would be a failure. Another action the insurgent player can perform is called train civilian. This allows the insurgent player to upgrade one of their civilian cubes to a trained uh, fighter. They spend four action points and they get a new unit on the wall. The insurgents can also build new cannons. They do this by spending four action points and one of their supplies and placing a new cannon anywhere on the wall. Due to cannon fire, one of the spaces on the wall may be damaged. This usually is indicated with these tokens. Keep in mind that everything you see here is a prototype and these tokens may be different in the final game. These tokens indicate the, statu the status of the wall. This side signifies that this uh, space is damaged. On the other side, it indicates that the wall is destroyed. The reason we are explaining this is that one of the actions that the insurgent player can perform is called a repair wall. By spending four action points, they can turn a destroyed wall into damaged or a damaged wall into an undamaged section. The other the remaining three actions of the insurgents are similar to the actions of the imperial player. To recap, they can do support and add their tokens on uh, the surrounding areas, similar to the imperials. Whenever they add support in an area they already control, they place one of their markers there. If they are to add support in an area they don't control, they remove token of, of the other side. If all of the tokens are removed and they spend another support, they turn the tile to their side. The insurgent player has this track that indicates their plea for help from the government. This works in a similar way to the imperial track, but with a twist. Since most of the insurgents' requests for help were rejected, the only way for them to get help is if they roll a 12 by rolling two six-sided dice. However, every time they roll lower, their marker is moved by one space make, and the number is added to the next roll, making it slightly easier to get the achieved result. The insurgent can also spend three action points and as an action move this marker by one space. Finally, the insurgent player can also use preparation and spend action points in order to store them for future use. Please note that the preparation action is, has a slight difference between the two sides. The insurgents can only store up to two action points while the imperials can store up to five. In the action phase, the players alternate playing cards until both of them have played seven out of the eight cards they had. Then they move to the next phase where the cannons fire. First, the Imperial player's cannons fire. The odds of success depend on their distance from the wall. In order for a cannon on the third row to hit, it needs to have a result of six but in by rolling two six-sided dice. If a cannon on the second row attacks, any result of five or higher is a success, while a cannon right in front of the walls needs a result of four or higher. Whenever an Imperial cannon uh, hits, it does damage on the walls. 
This damage is indicated by these tokens, which are placed over here. This side indicates that the wall is damaged, while the other side indicates that the wall is, is destroyed. The benefit of having a section of the wall destroyed is that it allows the Imperial units to move on uh, to, that piece, uh, to that space on the wall. The cannons of the uh, insurgents fire after the uh, Imperial cannons and they work in a similar way. In order for a cannon to hit uh, the row in front of it, it needs a result of 4 or higher on two six-sided dice. In order to hit on the second row, it needs a result of 5 or higher, while in order to hit the third row, it needs a result of 6. Every time the insurgent player hits, it, they remove one unit of uh, the Imperial uh, units. Keep in mind that if a player removes all opposing units in one space, for example, if an insurgent cannon removes all three here, or if an imperial cannon removes, let's say, this cannon removes the last unit there, we have a change in morale. Whenever a change in morale occurs, the player that uh, triggered it can choose either to increase their morale by one, or lower their opponent's morale by one. So if the Imperials remove uh, a unit, the last standing unit on a space, they can lower their opponent's morale by one or increase their own by one. If the insurgents remove all units in one space or Imperial units in one space, they can increase their morale by one or lower their opponents. This change of morale, when the last unit on a space is removed, happens not only on cannons, but also on attacks performed during the action phase. Basically, any time that one unit, uh, that the last unit in one space is removed, uh, then the opponent has the option to increase their morale or lower their opponents. The last phase is the replenishment. During this phase, the players check the tiles in the surrounding areas and get the rewards for the ones they control. These rewards are depicted on the bottom of each tile and it can be either supplies, morale or additional units. After the player gets these rewards, then it is time for them to uh, pay for their troops and, uh, feed, uh, and also feed them. First, the Imperial player pays money for his mercenary troops and then spends supply tokens to feed them. The insurgent player does the same with his troops, but only with supplies. However, he must first uh, calculate his exact population. He does that by adding the number of white cubes and blue cubes, and then using this track to determine the amount of uh, food he will have to spend. He spends the, that number of supplies and players move to the next round. At the beginning of each round, the players refill their hand back to 8 cards. This is the administration phase. Before the next action phase, there is one more phase, which makes more sense to talk about now that you know the actions. This is the opening phase in which the Imperial player moves five of his units one space forward, and the insurgent player has a chance to regroup based on what their opponent did. Then the action phase for the next round begins. To recap, the actions in every round are administration, where the players get uh, new cards, opening, where the imperial troops advance towards the wall and the insurgents get to regroup, the action phase, where the players alternate playing action cards from their hands, 
the cannon phase where the cannons of both players fire and the replenishment phase where the players get the rewards from the surrounding areas and feed their troops. At the end of the third uh, round the first period ends and the second period begins. This is indicated here on the track by this symbol. The first three rounds are the A period, the first period, and the next three rounds are period B, the second period. When the period changes, there are some changes on the board. Thematically, this signifies the arrival of the Egyptian troops, the allies of the Ottomans, that come to assist in the siege. The Imperial player gets to add these uh, allied troops in the board, which are placed in the first rows. The, ally, the insurgent player gets a number of new civilians within the city. And the, the new Egyptian troops bring with them some more supplies for the Imperial player and some more money. However, for the second period, the demand in uh, uh, money at the replenishment phase is higher as well as the supplies needed to feed all these extra troops. Keep in mind, if at any point the morale goes to zero, the, the side loses. At the end of the third round, a change occurs, which is also shown here on the track. The first three rounds are considered to be period A, or first period, and the next three rounds are the second period. When the period changes, what happens is that Allied troops for the Imperials join the siege. Egyptians, led by Ibrahim, arrive, and with strong forces at sea, they can come to assist. When this happens, the Imperial player gets to add more troops on the board, which are indicated by these green uh, cubes. These are called Allied troops, and they operate just like the rest of the Imperial troops, with one important difference. They are better operators of cannons, and they have a, a bonus of plus one in all their cannon rolls. Also, it is never allowed for uh, the red cubes and the green cubes to coexist on the same space. The other thing that happen when the period changes is that the Imperial player gets some additional money, some additional supplies, and some uh, support at sea, which may end up uh, and the tile turning into his favor. However, his needs for uh, money and for supplies are now higher since he has more troops to feed. For the in insurgent player, the period change uh, means that more refugees are arriving to in the city since it has stood the sheet and, and has not fallen. Many people come in and seek uh, refuge. However, by having more civilians inside the city, the needs for uh, food and for supplies is now much higher. Also, when the period changes, the players start to use another deck. The first deck is used only for the first period, the first three rounds, while the second deck is used during the last three rounds of the game. Hopefully by now you have a good idea on how the game plays and all its key aspects. If this sounds like a game you enjoy, please make sure to check the game's Kickstarter campaign page, launching on March 25th. You can also find the link for the campaign in this video's description. Thank you for watching. This is Freedom.